from the very beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church, that is, through you and me, will be manifested even to principalities and powers in the heavenly places, the final and the full display of the love of God. My name is Dan Jackson. I am a broken human being. But I am not staying that way. Because the Lord Jesus inspired the Bible writers to tell me very specifically that he hasn't given up on me yet or up, up on you. You're a broken human being. All right. Your coat was hung up on your microphone. Hallelujah. Thank you. You know, I, I wanted you to know that I was a broken human being, but I didn't want you to think I had hang-ups. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor. <laughs> You're a gracious man. <laughs> God has promised in his word that he who has begun a good work in you will also complete it until the coming of the Son of Man. And we praise and honor his name for that. We are broken, but we are growing by his grace. Jesus, my profession is the only North Star in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What we preach, what we teach, what we believe ought to, must be centered in the life, the death, the resurrection, and the power of God unleashed through Jesus as he ministers in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Would you bow your head with me as we pray? Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we... Thank you so much for your grace and for your goodness. We thank you that you have made a promise to each of us, and it's not a denominational promise or a collective promise, but rather a promise to us personally. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Come by us now, Heavenly Father. We loved what we heard, come back to the place where you belong. And Heavenly Father, give us that sense of home in your presence by being with us here tonight. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to turn your attention this evening to uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to read several of these verses, or many of the verses. So if you have a Bible, please take it out. I'm reading from the New International Version, and here's what the Bible says. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then they lowered the man and the mat, the mat, they lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are, or, are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, 
take up your mat and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Isn't he a wonderful Savior? Isn't he a God of amazing initiative? And by the way, I, I, I do want to thank our brother from uh, Papua New Guinea for the stories from night to night. Praise God that it didn't end at the end of the book. And it was never God's intention that it would. Here's the plot of this story. The time is the first half of the first century AD. The place is Peter's house in the modest village of Capernaum, city, uh, situated on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee in Palestine. Uh, Peter is one of the conservative Jewish people living in this fishing and farming community. Now, first century houses in Capernaum were typically made of irregular stone walls with roofs of thatch and clay placed across wooden beams from wall to wall. The event, uh, the miracle-working rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, has arrived at the house of Peter. A feisty, opinionated, hard-working fisherman with his family and with his mother-in-law. The villagers came running, pressing, pushing, would you not have done the same if you lived in Capernaum? Suddenly, a large group of clergymen are pushing to the front, and they have surrounded him, preventing anyone else's access to him. The word on the street is simple. They have come there because they are jealous of Jesus, and they want to get a scoop on him in order to destroy his influence and then possibly to destroy him. That's the plot. But there is a counterplot. There is another house in Capernaum where a man affected by paralysis has lost all hope of recovery. His disease was the result of his own life of sinful choices. And he was embittered by remorse. He had already appealed to the Pharisees and to the doctors, hoping for relief from the mental suffering and the physical pain that he had to endure every single day. But they coldly pronounced him incurable and abandoned him to the wrath of God. It was his friends, by the way, who first encouraged the paralytic to go to Jesus. They heard he was coming, and it was his friends who suggested to him that he ought to go and seek help from the young rabbi. He was being drawn by a force outside of himself, and his hope came to life. You see, from the very beginning of this story that's recorded in Mark chapter 2, and in Matthew 9 and Luke chapter 5, from the very beginning of this story, Jesus was drawing the paralytic to himself. I want to make several observations about this story. And some of them may shock you. Some of them may please you. But observation number one is this. It was the religious leaders who blocked the way of the crippled man, both physically and spiritually. I don't want to talk bad about leaders because then I'm talking bad about myself. But as you read this story, you have to draw that conclusion. It was the leaders who blocked the way physically and spiritually. The book Desire of Ages, page 268, makes this statement. The spirit of life brooded over the assembly, but the Pharisees and the doctors did not discern its presence. Wow. They had formed such a tight human circle around Jesus that no one could get close to him. And as I said, they had come to this gathering with nefarious intent to produce evidence which they could use to condemn Jesus. 
How absurd that Jesus healing, preserving, building while the leaders were attempting to tear him down. In a rather interesting turn of events, the gathering at Peter's house was a time of building. It was a time of healing. And it's fascinating to realize that the only way the man could get to Jesus was to tear the place apart. The gathering at Peter's house was a lot like a large religious convocation where the excitement and the sounds and the smells of the event can drown out the reality of the purpose of the event. Uh, we can, if we allow ourselves to, to, to forget the object and the purpose of our gathering. The only way for this paralytic to get a hold of Jesus, the only way was to create a, disturb, a disturbance to tear up the roof. He had to get by the religionists and religiosity in order to find the master. Now she came up to me. She was a, 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 a heavy set woman. She had tattoos almost from head to toe. And the first thing she said to me was, I am so glad to be a Seventh-day Adventist. But I had to find God in a broken down car. And she said, I, I didn't know him. I could not tolerate the idea of walking into a church, any church. And so I began to challenge God, if you are really there, show yourself to me. And she said, you know, God works in the most interesting ways because I had not been able to achieve connection with God. My friends who were Christians could not bring me to him. And one day I was trying to get to work. She said, I live by myself way out in the country. And I was driving home when my car broke down absolutely died and I was late to work and I was going to lose my job and I was frustrated beyond belief. I saw one home off the road and I walked up that long driveway and knocked on the door and a man came to the door and she said, I said to him, could you drive me home? It's a strange Strange request. Can you drive me home? My car just broke down over there. And I need to get home to get my uniform and go to work. So could you drive me home? And then would you drive me to work? The man said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. They got in the car and they started to drive. And he got her home and then he turned and took her to work. But in the meantime, she discovered that he was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor who gave her an introduction to God. He didn't give her an introduction to the church. He gave her an introduction to God that she accepted. And then later, she became a, became a member of the church. She had to get by the religious, religionists and religiosity in order to find the master. Observation number two. Though we recognize the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit and we recognize the reality that Jesus was drawing this man, it is also true that he had to create his own point of access to Jesus. Again from the book Desire of Ages, again and again, the bearers of the paralytic tried to push their way through the crowd, but in vain. The sick man looked about him <clears throat> in unutterable anguish when the longed-for help was so near. How could he relinquish his hope? At his suggestion, 
His friends bore him to the top of the house and breaking up the roof, let him down to the feet of Jesus. Many years ago, I was preaching this sermon, not this sermon, but a sermon on this same subject. And at the end of the sermon, as folks were leaving, a father looked at his little son and said, so son, what did you learn today? And the little boy looked up at his dad and said, well, I learned they sure wrecked that guy's roof. (laughs) And if we don't look more seriously and carefully, that's basically the kind of immature process that we will walk away with. The roof was a very challenging point of entry, as you might know. You had to not only actually get up on the roof, but with their bare hands, those men had to start disassembling the clay and, the, and the, the thatch that was over. It was the extremity of the situation that demanded the extreme action on the part of the paralytic and his friends. They had to take the action. They had to use their own hands. But as they were committed to the life of their friend, They did all that they could to get him before the master. We need to reflect. As Christians, we need to reflect. Because, you know, there are times when we can make it exceedingly difficult to others or for others to enter into the presence of God or to enter into the fellowship of the church. We have all kinds of reasons to keep them away. It could be a matter of eat or drink or some truth that we hold dear. We could even at times create barriers of gender, age, race, ethnicity, or socioeconomics. We may even use standards, the standards of the church. George Wright, who, or George Knight rather, who wrote the book, The Fat Lady and the Kingdom, made this statement. He said, standards are often the tools we use to kick or keep the people out of the church that we didn't want in the first place. Nextly, the man had to get through the roof created by those who would not yield to the thought that there was a new way to the kingdom being initiated by the king himself. Uh, Paul, by the way, calls what Jesus was doing and what Jesus did the new and living way in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. It is possible that in our self-conceived attempt to preserve what we have, that we may actually ignore the presence of God and the activity of of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit prompts us. Consequently, it is possible for you and for me to build walls and roofs. And I really say that the wrong way, right? You all say roof. You know, it's those Canadians who say roof. Our dogs go woof, woof to us. But it is possible that we may build walls and roofs that are constructed on the foundation of our own provincial and narrow-minded thinking. That is, in terms of who we are and what we think and what organization we belong to. Uh, Perhaps one of the more frustrating moments in my life as an administrator was in a small church in the prairies of Canada. What was happening in that church was that a group of native Indian children had come to vacation Bible school. There were nine or ten of them. They loved it so much that every Sabbath morning they would show up to church. You know, that's a wonderful thing. Of course, the saints weren't too sure of it when they saw them chasing each other and running right through the baptistry. They didn't like the way they behaved during the worship service. And so ultimately... We were sitting there as a group trying to understand when we could have a specific program for these people. And do you know that that little church that didn't actually do too much in the world couldn't find a time in the schedule on the Sabbath day to have a special program? 
And they lost those native Indian children. Martin Luther King Jr. put it this way. He said, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. My job is not to please myself. My job is not to impose my thinking, my standard on everybody else. I am not saying compromise beliefs and standards. That is not what I am talking about this week. And if anybody tells you that, well, you tell them to come to me and we'll have a talk. A young street person walked into a church I was pastoring one day in sneakers and jeans. Someone caught her and said, this is not the way you come into God's house. She turned around and she walked out. I went to visit her. She had been baptized. I'm, this is a second story. She had been baptized into the church. And I went to visit her. Her husband was an Italiano. I mean, we had a good time. It was wonderful. We had a wonder. He welcomed me with open arms. And I met her. And I said to her, I am the new pastor in this area. I just want to come and tell you how much we would like you to come back to church. And she looked at me and said, Pastor, this has been a wonderful visit, but I just want you to know I'm the first elder of the Pentecostal church just up the street. I'm not going to knock Pentecostals, but what I am saying is she was a Seventh-day Adventist, so I said to her, what happened? And she said, well, one day I was in church and I was filling out my tithe envelope and the person sitting behind me tapped me on the shoulder and said, you are robbing God. You are robbing God. She said, I walked out. I've never come back. The paralyzed man had to have a determination to respond to the grace that was beckoning him. The fact is that grace is an eternal force that reaches out to us. It comes after us. The force of God's person is wrapped up in his grace. It cannot be curtailed or eradicated by temporary human efforts to thwart it. It ultimately overpowers the darkness because it is the light. Observation number three. And I love this part. In spite of all the play and interplay of the negative factors in this story, the power of grace prevailed. We serve a Savior of immense initiative. He is a God of tenacious grace. Listen to the scriptures. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. On the worst day that you have ever had in your life, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus and his ministry today was for you on that day. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 21, yet this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, for his compassions fail not, they are new every Sabbath. Every morning, <laughs> great is your faithfulness. And Romans 8, 31, which I think we ought to read and read and reread. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also? And I love the next, thing, the next three words. How will he not also, along with him, give us all things? In other words, how is it possible that God who gave Jesus Christ to the human family will not provide us 
with our every need. This statement from Signs of the Times, March 17, 1887, bears careful consideration. The shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. This should not be the great motive with us, for it savors of selfishness. It is, is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God should be held before us that we may be compelled to right action through fear? It ought not to be so. Then she says, Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. He says to us, I am the Lord your God. Walk with me and I will fill your path with light. Uh, Jesus, the majesty of heaven, proposes to elevate to companionship with himself those who come to him with their burdens, their weaknesses, and their cares. He will count them as his children and finally give them an inheritance of more value than the empires of kings, a crown of glory richer than has ever decked the brow of the most exalted earthly monarch. The paralytic had a problem. The problem was people. It is like that old comic we have found the enemy, and the enemy is us. Paralytic had a problem. You and I are called upon to reverse that trend. If we will live the gospel, we will sense, we will understand the battles going on in the human family, the battles that are going on in the lives of of the students in our academy and the students in our university and the students who attend the public schools and other universities, our hearts will reach out to them. But we will also have a heart that goes out to the poor. To be the gospel means that we will reverse the flow of the human tendency to reject that with which we are not familiar in terms of human need. I was conducting a baptism and I decided that before the baptism I wouldn't just go through the baptismal vows with the candidates, but I would rather ask them, how in the world did you become a Seventh-day Adventist? Why would you want to do that? The young woman with her husband and her children sat in front of me and made this statement. She said, at first I would bring my children to Sabbath school and then I would leave as quickly as I possibly could. But Sabbath after Sabbath, as I walked through the front door of the church, he would greet me. Uncle Peter, she called him. Every single Sabbath, the same greeting, the same kindness, the same genuine Christianity. I made a decision without any Bible studies that I had to have what Uncle Peter had. It was not so much a plan as it was his life, as it was who he was. We don't get that way, except that we spend time with God. Every Sabbath, the members of the church, and the, the congregation was about a 500-member church, the members of the church would find out where Uncle Willie was standing, and they would exit the church from any other exit. Because they knew if they came, came close to Willie, that he was going to say, 
let's go out for one hour and give out it is written television logs. <laughs> they stayed away from him. But week after week, month after month, year after year, Willie went out in that city and handed out it is written logs. When it is written came to town, the first night of the evangelistic series, 400 people walked into the auditorium who had never walked in the door of a Seventh-day Adventist church. 400 people walked in and they said to the speakers, you have been in our living room for years. Why haven't you been in our city? 100 people or over 100 people were baptized in that meeting and everyone who knew knew that it was the faithfulness of an unsung hero, Willie, who had alerted people. The story of the paralytic is a call for all of us to be the gospel in shoes, uh, to the unnoticed, to the lonely, to the uncared for, to the unwanted, to the abused. Uh, about a week ago, I was in Loma Linda at the Loma Linda University or the, the, the Loma Linda Hospital University, the whole complex at that board. And they took us to a place called the Children's Assessment Center in San Bernardino. And they educated us in a way that I didn't want to be educated in, to be honest. They told us that in the two counties, San Bernardino and Riverside counties, in those two counties alone, 120,000 children are being abused on an annual basis. We don't know what the total is for the United States or for Canada or Bermuda or Guam and Micronesia. We don't know what those totals are. But we know that in our world today, there is an immense human suffering. And that you and I as Christians need to be aware of the reality that God is calling you and me personally to serve. Personally to reach out. You see, soul winning is in fact a science. It requires a search for understanding. First of all, understanding the needs of the human heart. It is a search, or it requires a search for the understanding of the needs in our community and how to address those needs in the most intelligent and effective ways. Uh, Jesus had an experience, and I, I think it is an experience that you and I need to read about and think about and pray about. It's a great illustration for what I'm trying to say tonight. It's Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well, at the well of Sychar. And when you read the story, you need to watch the ebb and flow of the of conversation. Now, he engages the woman in a very ordinary circumstance, her daily draw of water from this ancient well. It was as if Jesus walked up to your desk or up to your garden. And he used questions. He exercised attentive listening, and he always demonstrated respect. Read Jesus' story there. Uh, he makes probing statements and utilizes the ebb and the flow of the conversation, moving forward at times and at times pulling back but always keeping his heart-reaching purpose central. Friends, I want to give a clarion call tonight. It is time for you and for me to become intentional about the world around us. We cannot be the gospel sitting on our couch. We cannot be the gospel 
attending church on a regular basis. Those are good things. I enjoy sitting on my couch. And I enjoy going to church. But the Lord Jesus calls you and me into a higher, deeper experience. It's time that we became intentional. It is time for us to say, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. You see, we have much to study and learn in terms of being the gospel. However, the textbook is already in our homes. The life of Jesus as recorded in his word. Uh, We must engage in more purposeful, prayerful searching of his word. Living in the days immediately preceding the second coming of Jesus, our Lord is calling us. He is not calling, quotes, of the church, corporate. He is, but he does that through a call to you and me personally. We need to get over the idea that our tithes and offerings support the ministry that we do not want to do. For some groups of people, such as refugees, the severely abused, those with serious life-endangering and life-inhibiting disabilities, the LGBTQ, we may well need more information to understand in order to use non-offensive vocabulary. You see, whether I agree with the position or not that a person has taken, it doesn't mean God doesn't love them. We must do all that we can to reach, to befriend, to be the gospel. Pray with me. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that your call comes to us personally. And Father, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed tonight, I want to reach out to this wonderful group of people. If you have been putting off a decision to become more involved in the ministry of Jesus and you want to commit to him tonight, Lord, I do not want to be in the way. I want to be a facilitator of your grace. I want to invite you to raise your hand with me. Father, you see the hands. More importantly, you see and understand of the hearts. May your spirit imprint in our minds our need. Personally, for you, always in our lives. And then nextly, to have us reaching out and sharing the blessings of life in your presence. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.